right, so now we're going to look at number five here. Which of the following responses would be most acceptable to a person who values individualism? So politically speaking, someone who values individualism likes a democracy. Taken to an extreme, they like anarchy. They like no government, right? So which of the following responses would be acceptable responses to the cartoon? Looking at the cartoon, it begins, do you hate taxes, hate government, hate regulations, love guns? So somebody that likes liberty would be agreeing with the cartoon so far. But then it says, life's better in Somalia. And in Somalia, the person who likes anarchy is surrounded by you know, warlords and anarchists and, and pirates. And no doubt that person might be not that safe. So the cartoon is actually a satire making fun of the simplicity of we don't want government, saying that you really don't want government, go to Somalia. But based upon what life looks like in Somalia, we wouldn't really want to go there. So which of the following responses to the cartoonist would someone who values individualism have? They probably disagree with the cartoon then because it uses satire and exaggeration to attack liberty. It's exaggerating how bad things might be in Somalia. So then the answer to five must be B then. Any cartoon is meant to be a satire, which is an exaggeration. Here the satire is poking fun of this idea that, oh, life would be better without government. And they're saying, well, move to Somalia then. And the cartoon is saying, that's really not a great option. So moving to number six, it's always good to look at the question before we look at the sources. Although both photos were taken in democracies. They ironically embrace the collectivist. You'll probably be able to hear me better with the microphone on. Uh, ironically embrace the collectivist principle of prioritizing law and order. Demonstrate that individual freedom must always be subject to the general will. Ironically embrace the collectivist principle of adherence to collective norms. Demonstrate that during a crisis, the government must res reserve the right to limit liberty. So looking back at the sources, these are pictures on, on beaches. I don't really see a crisis. There's not like a, a terrorist attack on America in the 1920s, and therefore we have to have modest swimsuits. So it's not D. So now we're down to ironically embrace the collectivist principle of putting law and order first. Law and order from pages 71 to 85 of the textbook is, is kind of like, uh, you know, law and order is more important than individual rights and freedoms. We're going to make sure that we have police that are controlling us. And yes, the people are being controlled by police. So there's some pull to that. But, you know, when I think of France in 2016 or America in the 1920s, I don't think of a police state like the Gestapo. I think of the Nazis having a police state. So I'm not sure that that's going to be the answer. Demonstrate that individual freedom will always be subject to the general will. So the person's freedom in Source 1 to have a more revealing bathing suit is subject to what the society says is acceptable the people in the second source um, you know wearing a burkini might be inappropriate in France because society says it's unacceptable so that might be it ironically embrace the collectivist principle of adherence to collective norms so in the first one they have to adhere to the collective norm of the bathing suit and in the second one they're adhering to the collective norm as well um, so which one is more clearly the, the example? Well, we don't know if what is being enforced is the general will, but we know that they have to adhere to it. So C would be our better answer. So adherence to a collective norm is that we have to follow what the government's saying. Although both photos were taken, oh, we did that one. Uh, number seven, the principle of collectivism that is most valued in the above idea. Self-interest, I'm going to think of Adam Smith and uh, the invisible hand. So if it talks about that, that's going to be it. Common good is more of a collectivist thing that I, I need to help others. Uh, I'm doing it for the good of the community, good of society. Uh, individual liberty, individual freedom, uh, collective responsibility. Your, your misfortune means that I need to act to help you. Uh, the Canadian government guarantees our freedoms, but these freedoms can threaten the democratic system itself. Therefore, it is justified for emergency legislation to be at the disposal of government to protect us from threats. So we have freedom, but during a crisis like a terrorist attack, freedom can be taken away 
can be taken away because of capitalism? No. Can be taken away because of individual liberty? No, it's individual liberty being taken away. So it's either saying that liberty can be taken away for the common good, or liberty can take away because we need to help one another. Collective responsibility. So it's suggesting that our liberties can be taken away if democracy is threatened itself. So in order to preserve democracy, we limit liberty during crisis. So that's a pull to the idea of common good, right? That it's in the common good of saving democracy, we have to limit liberty. And that's why it's B. D would be more like, um, you know, it's not fair to have some Canadians suffer homelessness or houselessness. So we must tax the rich to provide some housing for the poor. We have a responsibility for them. That would be D. I'm going to just go close the windows because he's going. look at number eight eight to thirteen have a whole list of sources there and there's there's ten I'm not gonna want to read all of those so we're gonna have to see why we're reading them a supporter of laissez-faire a supporter of capitalism a supporter of free market Adam Smith little government would agree with which combination so if I look at at statement one and that's pro capitalism now I'm down to A and C if statement one isn't pro-capitalism, now I'm down to B and D. So I'm going to look at statement one to begin with. There will always be those in need. One should never be callous nor romantic about it. Compassionate societies and politicians who govern should attempt to combat poverty. But there's a difference, for example, between an able-bodied male and a handicapped mother. So this one's saying that there is some role for government to help some, but not to help all. So that's not, that's not pure capitalism. But it, it might be, might be enough um, freedom that it, it could be one of the options. So we're not clear yet if that's going to be one of the options. We can see that A and C, neither of them have number three. So if number three is correct, then it's got to be B or D. So I'm going to go to three next. Perfect social security is attainable. The formula is simple. Pick a place where there is no capital punishment and kill a police officer in cold blood. You will receive food, clothing, and shelter for the rest of your life. You will also learn the inescapable truth. The price of complete security is loss of freedom. This person is using a metaphor to argue against socialism, argue against government. A capitalist would use that. So three is one of the answers. So it has to be... B or D. So both B and D have three, but D has four and, and B does not. So if four is capitalist, then D is the answer. So we can go and look at four, and if it's clearly capitalist, now we have the answer. Seems each, equally logical to me that individuals cannot be free if they're beset by fear and insecurity. To my mind, the welfare state is simply a state in which people are free. Um, Capitalists don't want a welfare state. Uh, they want to be free. Um, th th they don't want government to be intervening, right? So capitalists would argue against four. So then the answer has to be B. So I didn't want to read them all because there's 10. So I ended up reading three to find the answer. And uh, the answer has to be B. I can go back and double check and make sure five, six, and seven are all capitalist but I'm confident now that they are. The source that most that seems most inspired by Smith. Well, we already know A is not laissez-faire, so we can cross that off. And if the answer to number 8 was B, 3, 5, 6, and 7, then well, Adam Smith has to be 3, 5, 6, or 7. So it can't be A, can't be B, 
6 is C, 8 is D. So C is the only one it can be. So if we were right with 8, and, and we took our time to make sure we were, then 9 has got to be C. The practice of industrial paternalism. This was Henry Ford saying that the, the capitalists need to help their workers. So the like in his case, he's the owner of Ford Motor Company, and he paid his workers double the, the, the market uh, value of, of labor because he saw that they were suffering, and, and he said, well, if I can help my, my workers, then I don't have to retrain new workers, and I'll have more consumers. So it benefits me, but it also takes care of the, their problems. So we need to see one of them that talks about that. Um, so we have one. We've already read one, so we might skip that for now. Five, nine, and ten. So five, human labor applied to natural resources is the only way to produce food, clothing, shelter. Ah, uh, man, that doesn't really seem like it's talking about the capitalists need to help their workers. So I might kind of skip that one. Number nine, if Western society is to pride itself on its morality and decency, it can no longer ignore the plight of marginalized people. So if a capitalist is going to say, I'm a good guy, I need to help my workers. That kind of fits, but maybe, maybe not completely. So we'll look at the next one. It is not the role of the state to see that the poor, the indigent, are paid a minimum wage. It's the duty of their employers. Right there is the answer. Their employers need to take care of their workers. The answer is 10. So even though 9 kind of fits, 10 explicitly says it. Number 11. The source that most clearly shares the concerns of Karl Marx. So now I go back and say, okay, Karl Marx thought that there's this class struggle between the bourgeoisie, the capitalists, and their workers, the proletariat. So I, I need to see something about exploitation. Uh, 10 we just read. It wasn't about exploitation. 1 and 2 we've kind of already read. So we could look at 8. Government has a responsibility to provide aid for citizens experiencing immediate or ongoing crisis. That doesn't really sound like, like Marxism. So then we have to go back and look at 1 and 2. Something about exploitation. Rich against poor. The haves against the have-nots. Uh, that's number 2. An economic system based on private property, capitalism, turns citizens against each other. This class struggle has got to be 2. Which two support the largest contrasting opinion? Well, we know Marx is at one end of the spectrum. He's, he's a radical. So two might be one of the ends. Uh, A says two and seven. So we have to look and say, if seven's very capitalist, then A might be my answer. Uh, seven, individuals should have a choice whether or not to, be, to provide aid to others. Otherwise, forced reallocation of wealth is the equivalent of theft. That's capitalism. That's a pretty big gulp. Be, or uh, golf between the two, so that's uh, that's that's an extreme contrasting. Uh, we could go back and check the other three, but A does seem to make sense. Number thirteen, regardless of opinion, all these people share one thing. So regardless of whether they like individualism or collectivism, they all have to address one thing. So my question for you will be, when we began the economic unit. And I said, all economies in the world have the same problem. And how they address the problem should reflect their values. What's the problem that all economies have? Debt. They eventually get debt. And they get debt um, as they're trying to address something. Remember I said, you know, if I could just simply think things into creation, then I wouldn't need a job. But because I can't just think of Porsche 911, into creation, I have to work to, to buy a Porsche. And the idea is scarcity, right? That, that because of scarcity, we have to decide, if we can't make everything, what should we make? And if we can't make enough for everyone, who should get it? So B's got to be the answer for that. So even if you're a capitalist or a socialist, B is still a question that they both seem to address. So now we have a cartoon. 
And it's a very typical cartoon that you'd see on a diploma exam in the sense that it's from the 19th century. So it's a it's an historical cartoon and it's pretty simple. There's not a lot of extra stuff happening there. The individual at the top is most likely to be. So the person sitting at the top, smoking a cigar, reading a newspaper, sitting on a ball that faintly has the outline of the Americas on it, while a, a girl, a laborer, is carrying him. Does the cartoonist depict that person at the top as being a good person? You know, if, if I force a, an eight-year-old child to carry me around, am I being a good person? No. So only, only two of those are basically negative terms. Robber baron and inefficient bureau bureaucrat. Industrial paternalists like Ford are helping their workers. This guy's doing the opposite. He's a burden for the worker, so it's not B. An enlightened capitalist enlightened by the need to help others. So B and C are saying the same thing. It's neither of those. So either the person is a robber baron, someone who's having the, the life of a noble by robbing the value of a, of a worker, or an inefficient government worker. Is there any evidence in the source that the person is A or D? Are they a industrialist, a robber baron, or an inefficient government worker? It's going to be A, yeah. He's living that good life by robbing the wealth of the worker. Uh, 15, which of the following represents the most likely solution? So how would people solve the problem? And what is the problem in the above source? Exploitation. Karl Marx I have faith in the system to address itself. No, Marx said we're going to need a revolution. So it can't be A. Uh, Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt. Workers must realize that a square deal is only likely if they're willing to serve the interests of the capitalists. Well, Roosevelt did have a square deal, but he wasn't saying only the capitalists should win. The point of the square deal is that workers and capitalists need to find a way to, to have mutual benefits. FDR. Occurrence of exploitation are rare within a free market, and when they occur, the market should be free to correct itself. Or Milton Friedman, before the Industrial Revolution, virtually all children worked on farms. Once capitalism was embraced, nations could afford to not employ children. Um, so is it more likely that looking at that cartoon, FDR would say the market will just correct itself? Or Friedman would say children working is natural? Well, Friedman is a capitalist, would he defend capitalism? Probably logically, yep. FDR was a modern liberalist that provided relief recovery reform by regulating the market. Is FDR regulating the market in C? No, so it can't be the answer. So D has to be the answer. So we are going through these extremely quickly, right? So on your diploma exam, slow down. But on the diploma exam, what we're seeing here these are the hardest questions you're going to see economically speaking this year and you're getting them right so you're going to do well the most likely context context means like you know when did this happen why did this statement happen uh, for the above proclamation would be Luddite saying let's destroy the machines Chartist saying government needs to create legislation to help us modern liberals saying we need government to come regulate and and you know all that FDR kind of stuff Neoclassic libs like Reagan saying, wait a minute, neoclassic libs supporting Keynesian economics, that doesn't make sense. Neoclassic libs didn't like uh, Keynesian economics. So D, D is probably a red flag that can't be the answer to begin with. So as long as the needs of some go unmet, the true potential of our nation will not be achieved. In order to ensure that everyone experiences success, we must allow freedom through government. The phrase freedom through government matches with what? Which is not D, because neoclassic libs didn't like Keynesian economics. Freedom through government. Is that Luddite saying let's challenge new labor practices and go b blow up machines? No. So now we're down to B and C. Chart is saying um, we like individualism, or modern liberals saying we need government intervention. Freedom through government. Is that B or C? It's C. And again, we're flying through these questions, um, and you're getting them right. So, number 17. 
a quote that is um, pretty common. It is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner. So benevolence means that, like, I'm just a good person. So if the butcher is just a good person, then they, then they you know, butcher an animal and they, and they get some meat ready for you. If the brewer is a good person, then they, then they make some beer for you and they're like, hey, you know what, don't pay me. I, I just like to, to help others. If the baker does it out of benevolence, then they're baking you a loaf of bread and it's like, here you go, have it. I, I just want you to be well fed. It's not from the benevolence of these people that you get your, your meat, your beer, your bread. It's from something else. Why do they do it? Why does Mr. McBride work? Money. Which one of those says, I do it to benefit myself? So law of diminishing returns means that, you know, if I have 10 people that work for me and, and I hire 10 more, our productivity might not double because we might get in each other's way. It's not really talking about that. Specialization of labor means that, you know, if I work at a factory and uh, my job is very specialized, um, all I'm doing is, is running a machine and the machine puts that together, just does this, then I might become very efficient at it. That's not really talking about efficiency. That's talking about what motivates us. Iron law of wages, that was Ricardo saying, let's not help the people that have no benefit because if we do, then, you know, they won't die and then they'll become a burden. What is invisible hand? It's greed. It's, it's self-interest. It's this quote, right? In a command economy, um, what replaces self-interest? So the self-interest answers the three basic economic questions. What to produce, how to produce it, and how to allocate it. In a command economy, meaning the government commands the economy. So the best example will be in Chapter 5 with the USSR. Stalin's going to command the economy. Then instead of the invisible hand, self-interest, what directs the economy? This is a tough one because we haven't studied Chapter 5 yet but you might still be able to get it. So in a command economy where there isn't meant to be individualism, there's meant to be collectivism, um, how do they answer the basic economic questions? How would the government ensure that scarcity is being met? That's, that's, it, it could be a tough one. Did you guys look at um, like the USSR at all in grade nine? You had Mr. Feeble in grade nine? Okay. She didn't work here long? Okay. Uh, I was just trying to remember back to grade nine. And so in a command economy, government commands the economy. They answer the basic economic questions. It's one of those answers, A, B, C, or D, seem to be saying the same thing, that the government commands the economy, they answer the questions. Rather than having 40 million Canadians planet, you know, Trudeau and his government planet, that would be, if we were a command economy. I'm not sure I'm thinking A or C. Okay, well, yeah. you have the right answer is one of the two. So we get rid of B and D, replaced by principles of economic freedom. So economic freedom, does that sound like capitalism or socialism? The word freedom. No, no. So freedom is like individualism and freedom is capitalism. Security would be socialism. So being that principles of economic freedom is capitalism and command economy is the opposite, that can't be the answer. So it has to be A. Sometimes uh, by writing a test, if we know the answers, um, that's the way we can learn more than, than even sitting through a lecture. My... Uh, Emails keep coming up. Oh, I think it's all sorted out. So now we got a long chart about poverty in Canada. Again, I'm a lazy person. I, I don't want to, I could spend 20 minutes looking at that and trying to figure out what's going on. I need to look at the question and see why I'm looking at it. Of the following, after viewing the source, Anne Rand would most likely agree with something. 
Ayn Rand was the capitalist um, that that she's she wants laissez-faire, right? In in the 20th century, she really wants very little government, very little government. So anything that would make bigger government, she'd be opposed to, or anything that makes capitalism sound bad, she wouldn't she wouldn't like that. Um, Poverty affects one in five children. Least likely agree with poverty affects one in five children. Well, uh, I mean, I'm not sure what you'd think about that. Poverty affects three million Canadians. That's not really different than A. That's just instead of looking at just children, it looks at everybody. Poverty is due to circumstances beyond the control of the poor. Canada is below average in terms of global child poverty numbers. If I told you the answer was C, could you tell me why the answer is C? So Ayn Rand's a capitalist, and the source is saying, or the question is saying, would least likely agree with poverty is, is due to circumstances beyond the control of the poor. By stating that, if if Ayn Rand agreed with that, then Ayn Rand would have to accept what? that in order to help the poor they can't help themselves they need help from other people. from other people or government help from other people or government that sounds like collectivism Anne Rand doesn't want collectivism she wants individualism so being that Anne Rand doesn't want big government or you know forced taxation and redistribution of wealth then then sees the least likely thing she's going to agree with So I always like to throw some Maslow at my classes. So um, I'm going to have some Maslow here now. Now Maslow is a philosopher. He's more of a psychologist that talks about our hierarchy of needs. Um, this is probably just there so we can refer back to it. And it looks nice because it's a colored uh, chart. And then we have a quote and then a cartoon. Lots to deal with. Advocates of free markets, so a capitalist, would respond to the hierarchy of needs by arguing that the best way to meet the needs of the people. So a capitalist, which wants you know, a free market, free from government, would they argue the best way to meet the needs of the people is for the government to intervene? If a capitalist wants a free market, free from government, would they say that people need the government to intervene? No, he'd probably argue the opposite, right? Would a capitalist argue that the best way to meet the needs of the people is for individuals to care for their communities? Maybe. You know, maybe I should care for uh, my, my fellow neighbors, but that's kind of collective interest, not self-interest. For people to be left alone to meet their own needs, does that sound like individualism? Leave people alone. Let them take care of themselves. Or for the state and individuals to combine, to share so one of those things values individualism and freedom, and that's what capitalists value, and that's our answer. It's absolutely C. The most appropriate title for this cartoon in three would be Students get this one wrong in the past sometimes. So, capitalism solves our water shortage issues. If that's the case, then in the beginning of the source, there's not enough water, and at the end of the source, we have lots of water. The beginning of the source, it says, even though we have some of the best and safest tap water in the world, we buy other bottled water. So it's not that we have a shortage of tap water in the beginning. We actually have lots of water. So it's not really about shortage issue. The sustainability of our consumer choices. The most appropriate title would be we're making bad consumer choices. And and we can't and we can't sustain it because we're running out of resources. C mankind finds a lasting source of water. Well A and C are similar, so it's probably not about that. D mankind is irrational. So B and D are similar. The difference being D means that we're making choices that don't make sense. So if it's saying that we're making choices that don't make sense, it's D. 
if it's saying we're making choices that we can't continually make because we're going to run out of stuff, then it's B. So looking at the cartoon, what detail in the cartoon says we're making choices that don't make sense? doesn't make sense. All we have to do is go use tap water. So then the answer is D. Sometimes people overthink that one. Uh, now we have number 22, which goes back to the beginning of the year. Not just economics, but some of the introduction to the course. So now we have radicals and liberals and moderates, conservatives, reactionaries. We have the spectrum. And which of the following conclusions can be made? Because now they've drawn the spectrum in, a, in kind of a different way, right? So now we, instead of having a line, we have like a horseshoe. So why would they draw it as a horseshoe? Uh, to show that there are less moderates than any other group. Well, the word moderates all in capitals, no other group is. I'm not sure it's saying that there's less. Maybe it's saying that there's more of that. Liberals have more in common with radicals than they do with moderates. Uh, the word liberal, is it closer to the word moderate or radical? If you took out a ruler, and you measured it, which is the closer one there? Moderate, so it can't be the answer. Uh, conservatives and reactionaries share very few of the same values. Well, they're next to each other, so they must share some. Is there any pull to, as people become more extreme, some of their values converge? Is the line converging? Is it coming together? Do you, so a spectrum's like this, and here we have a horseshoe that's that's turning, right? And if I turn this anymore, it's going to snap. Um, are the radicals and reactionaries coming together at the bottom? Look again. <laughs> See how there's a, like a, a circle coming together? Now, the circle's not complete at the end, but instead of having it as two extremes, the, the thing is bent like this. And do the radicals and reactionaries have anything in common? Do we know of one thing that they agree on? They disagree about which direction society should go, right? Reactionaries say we need to go to the past. Radicals say we need to go into the future. But they also, but they do agree on one thing. And what do they agree on? How to get there, right? Radicals say let's use violence. Reactionaries say let's use violence. So that's why it's a horseshoe because they both accept violence. So we're almost done. So that's the idea of them converging, right? Is that they have some shared values. The value of violence is a means to an end. So now we have this, this sign outside. Everybody works but the vacant lot. Um, what's the purpose of this advertisement? To seek personal profit, to question government policy, expose the nature of capitalism, promote economic individualism. A and D are saying the same thing. Seek personal profit, promote economic individualism. They're, they're basically saying the same thing. So it's going to be tough to, to circle both of those answers. Question a government policy or expose that capitalism is not really a good thing. So those are the two things we're going to look for. It's either B or C. It's either saying government's wrong, they're doing something wrong, or capitalism's wrong because of something about the nature of it. So take a look at the source and see if you can pick one or the other. So I paid $3,600 for this lot and will hold till I get $6,000. The profit is unearned increment made possible by the presence of this community and enterprise of its people. I take the profit without earning it. For the remedy, read Henry George. 
everyone works but the vacant lot? If the answer is B, and it could be, then there should be some government policy mentioned in the source, either explicitly or implicitly. What's the policy? See, if this is a class of 35 people, then you wouldn't be on the spot all the time, right? <laughs> but now you're always on the spot. So what is the, so I paid $3,600 for this lot. Nothing about government yet. And we'll hold it till I get $6,000. So it's about somebody just flipping property. The profit is unearned increment made possible by the presence of this community and enterprise of its people around me. I take the profit without earning it. So we're considering B or C. What is the nature of capitalism? Remember when we looked at the quote about the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer? That's the nature of capitalism, self-interest, right? The invisible hand. So is this somehow saying the invisible hand is a bad thing? I paid $3,600 for this. We'll hold it till I can make 6000 The profit that I get from it isn't earned. I haven't done anything. It's just because the community around me has done something. It's a tough one. Yeah. So you can always put a question mark by it, and then before you, do you have to do these in order on your form? No. No. So if you don't have to do them in in order, you can always put a question mark by it, and then you can go back and and at the end of the test see if you are leaning one way or the other. More so. Number twenty-four. We have. The stock market uh, correction in 1929 that just continues on into the Great Depression. And then we have the housing bubble of 2008. And then we have some regulations. Combining elements between sources 1 and 2 would be helpful to address which of the following questions. So 1 shows the stock market crash. 2 shows the housing market crash. To what extent should the government address disparity? Disparity is like rich and poor. In order for that to be the answer, the church should be saying, here's how much stuff the rich people have, here's how much stuff the poor people have. That's a different chart. That's not what these are showing. Should the government regulate the nature of citizens? So what we're seeing is an unregulated business cycle in the stock market and remember, it was the nature, the gambling nature of citizens that caused the problem in 1929. What we're seeing in the second source is that the housing market uh, crashed because people bought mortgages that they couldn't afford. And banks, more importantly, they convinced people to buy mortgages that they couldn't afford. C, under what circumstances is the government justified monitoring the actions? C is more like surveillance. Like, uh, you know what, we have terrorism, so we're going to put up cameras. Um, are there ever circumstances where actions taken by the government end up causing market instability? So if both crashes were caused by the government doing something, not by the government not doing something, but by the government doing something, then D is the answer. If both crashes were caused by people, then B is the answer. You said D? Yeah. So what did the government do to cause the stock market crash? Well, I don't know about that, but about the housing. How do people do that? So with the housing, how did the people do that? Is that what you're asking? How did the people do that? Uh, the people, the bankers were the ones that created subprime real estate, not the government. It was the bankers that allowed for people to... Um, or and enticed people to buy houses that they couldn't afford. So, okay, so yeah, you. then yeah, then it's got to be B. Taken as a set, we can conclude that the crash shown in one caused the crash of two. The crash in one was 1929. The crash in two is 2008. Uh, usually, if something causes something else, 
there's not a big gap between them in terms of chronological order like that. So it's not going to be A or B because there's too big of a gap. There's like 80 years between them. The government actions in 3 caused the problems in 1 and 2. The government actions in 3 were in response to the problems. So if the regulations in 3 caused the problems in, in the other ones, it's C. If the regulations in 3 tried to solve them, it's D. Because you said the government didn't cause the problems in number 24, then only one of those can be the answer. Because in 24, you said people caused the problems. So if people caused the problems, then the regulations didn't cause them. The regulations solved them. So which one of those says the regulations, you know, solved them? D, right? Yeah. And then the last few sources have no source, meaning that it's just, do we know this or do we not? So sometimes these are the hardest ones. Who was most likely to proclaim government is not the solution to our problem, government is the problem? So which of those four people wants the smallest amount of government? So who's the capitalist? Who's the most capitalist? So, so Karl Marx would be the worst answer, right? Oh, you no, know, Karl Marx is, is, is not a capitalist. He wants to blow up the capitalist system, replace it with command economics. Uh, Owen's a socialist. So um, he, in, in, in the place of government, did a lot for his workers. So it can't be that. So Reagan... Did he like capitalism more than Roosevelt? If so, it's C. If Roosevelt liked capitalism more than Reagan, then it's D. Maybe it's D. You pick your answer. What do you remember about Reagan? Not that much. No? What do you remember about Teddy Roosevelt? I don't know. I didn't, those were like the two that I had the least knowledge about. So Reagan was the guy that... Um, Remember he exposed what he said were welfare queens, people living off the system that, that were getting checks that shouldn't get them, that there's a culture of dependence, and he cut spending on the poor and said that I'm going to cut taxes on the rich and let the benefits trickle down. Does that sound like smaller government? Cutting taxes, cutting spending? If so, then seize your answer. So you, you may want to change it if that's the case. Yeah. Which of the following alphabet agencies is the best example of government attempting to reform the economy? So we have relief, recovery, and reform. So one of these things is reforming the economy. So relief says people are struggling. We need to help them so they don't struggle anymore. Um, recovery this is something that's going to allow the economy to go from a depression and stabilize. Reform is like we're going to we're going to solve one of the problems that caused this, so it's not going to happen again. The SEC was the Security Exchange Commission. Uh, what it did was it regulated the stock market. One of the causes of the Great Depression was that the stock market was plummeted because people were speculating on the value of stocks. And they were speculating on stocks they didn't understand, and they created a, a bubble, an artificial bubble that made it look like companies were worth more than that they were. Given that the SEC regulated the stock market, and the stock market was one of the causes, the crash of it, of the Great Depression, and now that shouldn't be able to happen again, would that be a reform of the economy? If so, then that's the answer. Canada Action Plan. You remember that one? Um, we had that that pit, and 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 we talked about how um, there during the Great Recession uh, in Canada we invested in like the the Hende Highway, and the government you know expanded infrastructure spending and stuff like that. So the Harper administration they were trying to prime the pump, get the economy working again. So the Canada Action Plan is, is the Harper administration, the Harper government, trying to prime the pump, get the economy working again by investing in, in big projects. So nationalization means the government takes something that is privately owned and says, okay, Texaco, um, that's now going to be a Canadian company owned by the government. 
that that's not a private company anymore. That'd be nationalization. Austerity measure means the government's going to cut spending. Fiscal responsibility, government's cutting spending. Canadian economics, the government is going to try to create a uh, economic growth by spending money. So Canada Action Plan, investing in infrastructure development is which of those four options. So Canada Action Plan, we're saying we're in a recession and the government is is the government's aware that when we get out of the recession, we're gonna need like an Anthony Henday highway around Edmonton. So we're going to we're gonna pay for that. Fiscal responsibility. So fiscal responsibility means that we are gonna cut spending. If we're paying for the highway, that highway was probably pretty expensive, right? So it can't be that. And austerity is the same as fiscal responsibility. So it can't be both. So it, it's got to be neither. So nationalization means something that used to be private is now going to be public. If the Anthony Hende Highway existed before and the government just said, hey, instead of being someone's private road, now it's the government's, then it's A. Canadian economics is the government should prime the pump, get the economy working again. Then it's D, yeah. And number 29, which of the following reactions to the Factory Acts? So the Factory Acts, starting in 1803, were a series of government legislations limiting what capitalists could do. So putting things like minimum wage laws into practice. Luddites were pleased that industry went back to traditional manufacturing. If A is the answer, then we have no factories anymore. We just have people working by hand. That's not the answer. Chartists were displeased because government failed to protect children. I just said that they put into place uh, legislation that limited minimum wage and minimum age, so it can't be that. Marxists were skeptical that any government reactions would address the larger presence of class warfare. Marxists believe that in order to fix the problems of capitalism, we need what? A revolution, right? A violent revolution. Uh, would they be skeptical then that a democracy could fix it? Probably, right? Like, this isn't going to be enough. Uh, a Marxist might look at this and say, but, but these democratically elected parties, they're basically puppets of capitalists. So they're not really going to address these problems. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then we have the last and final question. Two collectivists, so this goes to pages 71 to 89, or 85 of the textbook, to a collectivist, instead of allowing competition to shape society, we should embrace what's the opposite of competition? Cooperation. Cooperation, yep. So now I would say go back and... Uh, Look at any that you have question marks on, and then when you feel ready, just hit submit. Yep. Yeah. The Luddites were, there was a guy named Neil Ludd, and um, at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, people were losing their jobs to less skilled people that could work with a machine. So rather than handcrafting something, somebody with a machine might be able to make what 20 people without a machine could do. So the skilled mer merchants were, were being, uh, or craftsmen were losing their jobs to less skilled people with machines. So the Luddites are reactionaries that tried to stop the Industrial Revolution by attacking factories and breaking machines.